Good afternoon and welcome to Southbridge uh, debate for the elections June 26, 2012. I'm Mike James, the chairman of the Republican Town Committee. And I'm Larry McDonald, chairman of the Southbridge Democratic Town Committee. We want to welcome you all to this part of the debates. If you're tuning in now, we are, we've already done the school committee debates and now we're going to do the debates for town council. Now what we have done, we have seven candidates, five are in attendance tonight for three open seats on the town council. Each candidate was seated by lot and uh, was completely randomly seated. And uh, the questions that are going to be asked them tonight were formulated by joint members of the Democratic and Republican town committees. So thank you for joining us. Thank you to the candidates for giving up your time. And thank you to the volunteers behind the cameras and operating the machinery tonight. Now, Mike will introduce our moderator for today's debate. Our moderator is Peter Cooper, Jr. He's a resident of Charlton. He has a wife and two children, and he has another on the way, any time it could happen. Uh, he attended uh, Shepherd Hills Regional High School for two years, and then he went to WPI um, Academy for Math and Science. Uh, he's been uh, 12 years a senior programmer at Checkerboard in West Boylston. Uh, he has his uh, bachelor's and master's in computer uh, science from WPI. Uh, he's uh, officiated CCG events in the, at the international level with thousands of participants. He is the Charlton Town Moderator for three years now, and he is a participant in the Mass Moderators Association. So I'd like to introduce to you Peter Cooper, Jr. Thank you. Welcome to all of you. I'd like to thank the Southbridge Republican and Democratic Town Committees for hosting this event. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out here or for watching this on cable. On June 26th, the people of Southbridge will have the opportunity to select who they want as their leaders on the town council. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to moderate the discussion to ensure that the voters understand the candidates' positions. Um, the candidates have been seated in a random order. Each candidate is going to have two minutes to introduce themselves with an opening statement. Then we're going to have rounds of questions. The questions have been written by the host Republican and Democratic Town Committees, and the candidates have not been told the questions in advance. The questions are in sealed envelopes. We'll be selecting a random one for each question in a round. Each question will have a primary responder. They will have two minutes to respond to the question. After that, each other candidate will have one minute to give their own response to the question. And then on the next question that we do, the next candidate down the table will be the primary responder, and we'll go like that for a round of five questions. We'll have as many rounds as time allows. Um, if a candidate references another candidate during their response, the moderator may allow the reference candidate a little bit of time to give their rebuttal to the statement. Candidates will, at the end, be given three minutes for their closing statements. So we will start with the opening statements. I'll randomly select a candidate to go first, and then we'll go from there. So seat, seat number one, Mr. Lazo. Thank you. Hi, my name is Steve Lazo. I was born and raised in Southbridge, and I'm running for the seat in town council to help make Southbridge prosper and to make it the best place to live in. My family has been a part of Southbridge for over 75 years, giving back to this community in many different ways. I'm the proud father of two boys that have went through the Southbridge school system, and they presently live in town. I have served on the Southbridge Housing Authority for four years. I've chaired it for three. I've served on the town council for 11 years. And in that time, I have served as uh, chairman of several subcommittees, one being general government subcommittee. I was chair. I was chair of the Persons Protection of Personal Property. I've been chair of the DPW. I have also been elected by my fellow councillors to be a cha vice chairman for two years and also the chairman of the Southbridge Town Council for two years. I was, I was instrumental in negotiating bringing the Registry of Motor Vehicles back into this town after they left Big Bunny Plaza. And I just want to say I'm also pro-education and I'm proud to be a part of the new high school being built. And I'm also pro-public safety. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Martinek. Thank you. I'm Dennis Martinek. I've lived in Southbridge for 12 years. During that time, I have been a citizen appointed member of the Charter Review Committee and the Planning and Economic Development 
uh, subcommittee as well. Maya Angelou said, if one is lucky, a solitary uh, fantasy can transform a million realities. As citizens of Southbridge, we should not have to fantasize about a town council that can work together on behalf of its citizens. We shouldn't have to fantasize about bringing businesses into town that can help us to create jobs. We also shouldn't have to fantasize about being treated with dignity and respect as citizens when we come to the podium to speak, or counselors and colleagues when they speak and have a dissension from those people in charge. We shouldn't also have to fantasize about improving our property values and reducing our property taxes, watching our water and sewer rates not going up, having transparency in government, and working towards a common goal, having town councilors who serve at our request and not at our expense. We shouldn't have to fantasize about not having a punitive trash tax of $250 imposed upon us. You don't catch a killer shark by poisoning the ocean and bombing the beachfront in pursuit of that person responsible. You go after the shark. When you have people that are causing a problem with regards to trash, you don't assume everybody in town is guilty and treat them as such. I'm running because I would like to transform all of these fantasies into a million realities. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hyde. Yes, my name is Jean Marie Hyde. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I've lived in Southbridge for five years. I've been in management for over 20 years. I've recently got my certification in accounting and in office administration. And the reason I'm up here sitting today is because I honestly believe we can turn this town into a great town by increasing jobs, getting growth in here. And um, with that said, there's a lot of possibilities, a lot of land that could be developed, um, vacant buildings that could be utilized. And with that, I can see great jobs going in there and I think it's time that we bring a new standard, bring up the standard of living to Southbridge. Excuse me, I've seen in the past that, you know, some things just go by the wayside, and I think every little detail, no matter how small it is, should really be addressed. And that's basically what I'm about. Thank you. Mr. Moriarty? My name is Sean Moriarty. I'm a Southbridge guy born and raised. Uh, I'm running for town council because I believe that we need to seek something better. Uh, I'm running for town council because I believe fervently that where you can make a difference, you should. I'm running because through my time as a local newspaper reporter, I know the background, I know the history of what's gone on in this town. I know how the government works, how it doesn't work far too often. I know what works. I've dug down uh, beyond what the politicians and administrators tell us and, and just give us as information to uncover the truth and get that information out to the general public. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And quite frankly, I'm just tired of the bad and the ugly. Uh, I'm tired of candidates and officials burning down one another's homes just to try to make theirs look better. And it's time, if not past time, that the town council focuses on what counts, which is the people. I believe that integrity counts, that morals matter, and that common sense means good government. Unfortunately, far too often, we can all see that common sense just isn't that common. I've worked as hard and as long as anyone that's up here uh, working to make this town better. I've spent the last 10 years serving kids and families of all kinds of backgrounds and demographics with the Southbridge Little League, uh, including the last five years of the league's president. In that time, the league has made a number of steps forward. Uh, we've had the main field rebuilt. We built a new concession stand and press box to make the league more self-sufficient, uh, many other things like that, while still maintaining the lowest registration rates in the area. Through my time covering the town and, and running the Southbridge Little League, I've learned a great deal about the problems, the real problems, that many of our families and friends and neighbors uh, face and what matters most to them. My only campaign promise here tonight is uh, basically just to work for the town, to weigh each and every decision by asking what is good for Southbridge, uh, and work to balance our short-term needs and goals with our long-term. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Peliquin. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Amelia Peliquin. 
Um, I too was born and raised in Southbridge. Uh, I come from uh, four generations of roots in the community. Um, my father was William Peliquin and my mother um, was Sylvia Cowett and she's here today. Hi mom. Um, I am a product of the public schools here in town all the way through. I went to Smith College and I graduated in 2003 with a bachelor's degree in philosophy. Um, after college I worked in public libraries doing reference and IT work and currently I am self-employed as a freelance web designer while I stay at home with my two children. Eve is uh, three and Arthur is two. And um, I'm married. Um, my husband and I own a property in town and we're landlords. We have a four unit building that we live in and we rent out. Um, and I'm also very active in the community. I'm a member of the uh, Friends of the Library, the Moms Club of Southbridge and Charlton, the Democratic Town Committee, the uh, local arts center here in town, and I just recently joined the Board of Respira. So um, I just think, generally speaking, Southbridge is a great place to live with lots of potential and possibilities, and I think we really deserve to have a local government that we can really be proud of and that reflects our common values as a community. Thank you. I'll now select the first question of the evening, and the first responder will be Mr. Martinek. Should we expand our water company role to help other communities? Sorry, could you repeat that? Should we expand our water company role to help other communities? I think the easiest way to answer that is if it makes good fiscal sense, yes. It's kind of a broad question based on nothing there to determine what am I going to make that decision based on. Is it something that we're doing out of courtesy? Is it something that we're doing out of profit? Is it something that we have absolutely no reason for doing? If there's a real justifiable reason for doing such, I think it's worth looking at. But I, I don't think here or on the town council I would ever commit to doing something without knowing more facts. I think it's an interesting question. That's the best I can give you, because I just don't think there's enough data there to answer that. Thank you. Ms. Hyde? I also agree with Dennis, too, that uh, I would be all for it if, you know, for generating revenue within the town, um, provided there's more facts provided. I mean, that just seems like a kind of tricky question. Like, would we be for it? Well, what's all the facts behind it, that we really would need to research it and make sure that it is the profitable thing for our town. Thank you. Mr. Moriarty? Uh, much, much along some of the same lines. Uh, however, I know, uh, in particular from your, your town, Mr. Cooper, obviously Charlton uh, in particular has uh, a, a difficulty with water. Uh, and that's something that we've seen for a while, and, and that's the primary place that we deal with in terms of sending water elsewhere. Uh, so long as it is mutually beneficial, um, more so, uh, obviously we're focusing on, on benefiting our own town rather than uh, advocating on behalf of Charlton. Uh, but so long as it is not a, a fiscal detriment to this town, as long as we're getting something for that, uh, I see no reason why not to. Uh, we have plenty of water. That's one of the few things that this town has an abundance of in terms of resources. Thank you. Ms. Pelican? This is an incredibly difficult question to answer within one minute, but I will do my best. Um, yes, we have the incredible um, opportunity in that we have a lot of water in our community. We are blessed with water. We have multiple reservoirs. And also, one of our neighboring communities, Charlton, had um, is, is a place that needs water because they had an environmental spill several years ago that made a lot of the residential wells unusable. Um, that being said, I would really only be interested in expanding the water company if it's in the best interests of the town, which is not a question I can answer in one minute. Thank you. Mr. Lazo? Well, originally the line running to Charlton was done because the State Police Plaza and the, uh, the McDonald's Plaza up there on, on the Mass Turnpike uh, had contaminated water. Once the line was there under Clayton Carlisle as town manager, this was more of a humanitarian uh, issue, he uh, allowed, uh, he brought it forth and, uh, and the council allowed it to be brought to residents of Charlton because of contamination from uh, gas spills and, and such in, in certain areas. Uh, this uh, is now costing us money. Uh, as sending it to Charlton, as a humanitarian thing, I was, I was uh, on board with that. But now I see it as costing us money. We, uh, 
the thing is, I think that we should put the uh, valve at the town line and let them do what they give them a certain amount that we can afford to give them and let them treat it and, and, so, and so forth. Right now, we have to treat this water, sending it to Chowton. We've had to put chloramines in our water because chloramines hold up better in that long pipeline going to Charlton. Uh, I don't support chloramines. I think they're unhealthy for certain people. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will be initially answered by Ms. Hyde. Our town has one of the area's highest property tax rates. We also pay for water and sewer services, and the rates continue to rise. Is this justifiable? Ms. Hyde? Honestly, in my eyes, no. I, I really think that there's so many different ways. Let me back up here. The spending that's going on in this town, to me, is unjustifiable. There's things that the town is purchasing that really, I feel, is not a high priority. And in which case, with that spending, it seems that all the taxes are going up and up, and it's, to me, it's not justifiable. I even found out the other day, we're about the same rate as what Worcester is, and we're not even close to having that type of population, but yet, our homes and stuff like that is definitely, um, excuse me, is definitely being taxed like they are. Now on that term there, it's like, do I see it justifiable? No, um, personally I would like to see a, de a decrease and from what I understand, this coming year it's going to be going up again. And with that said, there's so many different ways to generate revenue without raising the homeowner's taxes. And basically what we have to do is go out and we have to start marketing our town as um, either as a team or with the town manager, let him get out there and start marketing the areas in which we're able to sell and, you know, get our land working for us. So. Thank you. Mr. Moriarty? Uh, pretty much government always finds a need for whatever money it gets. Uh, so whatever money is raised, we always, the town, uh, any town, typically will always find somewhere that they can spend that money, uh, whether it's justifiable or not. Uh, in, in this particular case, uh, I, I don't see uh, any desire, I don't see the rationale as to why the tax is going up 4.2 percent for fiscal 13. Uh, it's a significant increase. It's a significant uh, increase over the last several years, the last decade. Uh, the taxes have gone up significantly in this community. Uh, while we have a great number of different resources and services in town uh, that, that are definitely worthwhile and, and need money to, to fund those, uh, we need to do a better job of holding uh, the town budget accountable in terms of, of finding where there are excesses. Thank you. Ms. Heliquin. <clears throat> As somebody who's lived in the community for um, a very, very long time, I would say that um, the big thing is, is just how much they've increased within the last 10 years. Um, the Boston Globe reported in 2010 that our tax rates here in Southbridge went up 86%, which was the largest increase in central Massachusetts. So you see people who lived in the community for their whole lives that are suddenly having to adjust to tax rates that are much, much higher than they were historically. And also our water and sewer rates have gone up even more than our tax rates. Um, as somebody um, on the council, I would definitely be much more fiscally conservative than the people we have there now. And um, in general, yes, I, just, I really think we need to rein in some spending. Thank you. Mr. Lazo? Could you repeat that question, Peter? I'm sorry. I... Our town has one of the area's highest property tax rates. We also pay for water and sewer services, and the rates continue to rise. Is this justifiable? No. And, w and the reason why is we are one of the highest in the state. Uh, we have, we're taking gray water from Millennium Power Plant. We're taking sewer from Sturbridge. We're giving Charlton water. And we have the landfill account. And there's still never enough money. This leadership that we have in the past year has spent quite a bit of money. It's like an open checkbook for them. And they just keep spending, buying equipment, buying more equipment. 
and taking it out of water and sewer enterprise funds. Water and sewer is, is way too high. Water was privately owned years ago, and the sewer was included in your taxes. Now they separated it, and now it's a second tax on top of your tax, your property tax. It's got to stop somewhere. And uh, I won't support any new taxes. I won't support any new uh, debt if I'm elected again. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Martinet? I'd like to start by stating the obvious that I don't think anybody has brought up yet. It's a shame that we don't have the two incumbents here to talk to the fact that the property taxes of water and sewer rates have gone up. Last year we gained the distinction in central Massachusetts of having the highest tax rate per thousand, surpassing even Sturbridge by $1.20 per thousand. We're poised right now to go up by another 4.2 percent, which means that we're going to be somewhere around $18.50 per thousand. Now for those people that don't look closely at their bills, or if they have it embedded within their mortgage payment, you should really take a close look and see what that means. Because what it means to me, and I'd like to put this into real terms, I've lived here 12 years. My property taxes have doubled from $1,800 a year to $3,600 a year. Using the principle of 72 divided by 12, that's a compounded interest of 6%. So if you take a look at that and you take a look at the things we're spending money on, there's so much fat that could be cut out of here. We don't need backhoes. We don't need street sweepers. We need to buy only those essential items and make sure that those things that are nice to have wait. Thank you. And the next question will be started by Mr. Moriarty. How would you characterize the town's overall economic outlook, and what are your plans or ideas to affect it? it it's a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, there, there's obviously two ways to look at that uh, with the glass half full, half empty. Uh, right now, largely, it, it's relatively bleak. Uh, we're, we're stuck in, a, in an old mill town, uh, stuck in a, in a town that was most prosperous 50, 100 years ago, uh, and we've not moved past that, that timetable. Um, we have some resources, we have uh, some, some factors that can work for us if we can utilize them, if we can uh, uh, bring them forward in the, in the, uh, the, the right manner. Uh, we have down at uh, the old AO complex a number of buildings that are right there ready to be rehabbed, to be worked on. There are grants out there, there's all kinds of money out there for those sorts of, uh, of purposes that can be turned in to bring in uh, whether it's industrial or commercial or office and professional type space. Uh, and those are some of the things we need. The industrial park is up there uh, next to the landfill and, and that's, that's great that it's there, but it's, it's empty. It's a shell. Uh, so as much as we want to call it a park at the moment, it's not. It's just a bunch of empty lots. We need those to be filled and it's going to be difficult to do uh, with that landfill there. So we have to find ways to pull that off and pull that together. Thank you. Ms. Pelliquid. Um, this is also a, kind of a hard question to answer because I feel like any individual person who's running for office who says that they can personally bring jobs into the community is probably trying to sell you something. That being said, I feel like there are things we can do in terms of the policy level to make Southbridge a more attractive place to live and buy property and start a business. And that starts with making policies that make Southbridge attractive as a place where people are looking to move. Like, um, and one of the reasons I'm running this year is because I've seen what's gone on this year in local town government, and it really seems like there's been a culture of people who are, are actively opposed to the residents of the community as opposed to working for the residents of the community. And I take a holistic view of these things. I think that if Southbridge is a great place to live with good schools, safe neighborhoods, and a healthy real estate market, people will want to live here and invest here. Thank you. Mr. Lazo. Yes, uh, I won't promise uh, you can, I'll bring jobs into town the way it is right now, but uh, because I agree with Amelia and what she just said. Uh, as far as the uh, industrial park, uh, just recently at a, at a meeting, the, the town manager said there is no road to the industrial park. He called it Kyber Pass. Uh, we need $7.5 million more to build the road to the industrial park. I knew that when that road was going up there. I didn't support that road at first, and I still don't support that road because that road is a road to the landfill, not to the industrial park. If I was downtown, the downtown partnership is trying very hard to try and bring business into that area. It's an old mill town. There's no parking. Uh, 
we've had study after study. You could wallpaper your house with what we have in the cellar for studies. Uh, Sandy Ackley and the uh, Economic Development uh, uh, get the money. They do a study. But we don't have the money to go forward and get the job done. This town downtown needs parking garages. It needs some sort of parking. Uh, the, I don't believe in putting apartments over the buildings that they are there now because the uh, <coughs> residents occupy the parking. And the businesses up. downstairs just don't have a place. And that's why uh, I don't Thank believe you. it's feasible. Thank you. Mr. Martinek. It's been a while since he asked. Could you just restate the question for me, please? How would you characterize the town's overall economic outlook? And what are your plans or ideas to affect it? OK. I certainly planning an economic development committee in 2009. I actually think this is quite an easy answer. I think at present time, it's bleak. As Steve uh, referred to in a recent uh, general government subcommittee meeting, what came out was that we don't have money to build a road to the, the uh, industrial park. Supposedly, several years ago, we spent $7.5 million to build such a road. And it turns out now that there's no off-ramp to get there. Our approach is to, to negotiate from a position of weakness, not strength. The proposal that the town manager was talking about most recently was to be able to have Casella pay for that road so we could finally get to the industrial park that we were talking about plans for three years ago in return for giving property to Casella. Nothing against Casella. If I were them, I'd jump at that deal. But what we should be doing is asking them to retire the debt that we've already expended so that we can make our own decisions and sell them the property. Thank you. And Ms. Hyde. Yes, um, as far as the outlook right now, it is very bleak. But on the other hand, everybody talks about this industrial park. And I myself, I'm very much for it. And I find that if it's done in the proper way, that it actually could be very profitable. If you take a look at the, um, the site itself, um, to me it reminds me of what Blackstone Valley used to look like. And right now there's a beautiful mall up there. So I figure if Blackstone Valley could do it, why can't we market industries and companies and try to sell our land to them and get like a small mall up there? And then that way, in turn, it has the possibility of uh, opening new jobs and generating some revenue into the town. Thank you. Our next question will start with Ms. Peliquin. There is much ongoing controversy over the management of our community. How do you think the town is being managed? Please give the voters a specific example. Well, um, if, I had, if I liked the way everything had gone this year, I wouldn't be running for town council. Um, that being said, the manager works at the pleasure of the council. And as somebody who's not currently on the council, I feel like I can only speak to the manager's performance on a certain level. And I'm committed to working with the manager should I get in. Um, that being said, I do not, there are several things that I have a lot of really big concerns about. Um, the uh, open meeting law violation at the EHS subcommittee last year, um, the Green Brown Consulting contracts. Um, I didn't really like the handling of the um, cable access um, changes and there's just a lot of things that, you know, had I been on the council this year, I, I would have liked to have seen done differently. So, that's it. Thank you. Mr. Lazo? As you know, I've worked with uh, town manager Clark. Uh, Mr. Clark does work at the pleasure of the council, and uh, he knows it. So it's basically the leadership that he has to listen to. And the leadership that's there now, he is listening to. Over the last year, uh, cable has changed. Uh, many other things have changed because he's listening to the leadership. And it's the way it is. It's the way the government is in this town. Uh, if Mr. Clark wants to keep his job, he keeps five councilors happy. And you can blame him, you can blame the leadership more than you can blame the town manager. Uh, I evaluated him, that's uh, on record. Uh, if elected again, I will work with Mr. Clark. Uh, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Martinek. Well, again, this would have been something that would have been interesting to hear from the incumbents who are missing in action today. But I, I look at it from a two-pronged approach. 
The town council is responsible to a certain degree because currently they're trying to cede more power to the town manager. As Steve was just alluding to, they want to put on the ballot, and they're going to have it on the ballot most likely this November, the ability to make it almost impossible to get rid of a town manager for lack of performance. On the other hand, we don't hold our town manager or our town councilors, for that matter, accountable. We have a very subjective review form. Not a lot of objectivity going into it, talking about how the town manager has accomplished this, come in under budget. Somebody got up at Citizens Forum not too long ago and made a plea, please don't spend $172,000 on a street sweeper. His decision was made on the fact that the DPW, who does a great job, hadn't asked for anything in years. That street sweeper went up and down my street three times, followed by another street sweeper. When we make bad investments like that, I think it shows very poorly upon the management of the, of the town, as well as the town council for forwarding it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hyde. Again, I agree with the rest of my incumbents here. I see as far as with the town manager spending the money on that street sweeper was totally poor judgment. Um, my feeling about him is if he is a leader and he is running our town, one of the things I would like to see changed is that he's made to live in the town. That way, what changes and what spending it actually affects his home life, as it's affecting ours, too. So that would be my one big change, is to have him move into the town. Thank you. Mr. Moriarty? I think, uh, I think uh, former Councilor Lazo uh, nailed the head pretty well there. Uh, as far as the town manager is very aware that he is serving at the pleasure of the council. Uh, he's very aware that he needs to keep five on his side uh, in order to maintain his job, keep his job. Uh, and, and this town has a, a pretty uh, well-documented history of over the last 10 years, really since Florence Chandler left town, uh, of instability in that position uh, for various reasons, uh, merited or otherwise. I would say that largely you have the council to blame. They're the elected officials that are charged with giving the town manager uh, a direction to go with. Uh, and, and quite frankly, uh, to a degree, the manager can be held hostage as a result. Uh, as a result, I think what we need is, is a council that's committed to the community uh, and, and dedicated to making solid progress. Thank you. And our next question will go to Mr. Lazo. I can get to it. <laughs> Characterize the atmosphere in the current council. How would your presence on the council affect it? How would you hope to influence that atmosphere? Well, the present council leadership, I think, is rude. I think they try to stifle the general public when they come to the podium. I served with the present people that are sitting there. They are vicious. They come after you, and it's not right. If I get back on, if I'm voted in by the people, there are two councilors out there that were elected last year, Councilor Langevin and Councilor Marcucci. I've served with them before. They have the utmost uh, respect for other councilors not like certain ones that have been elected in the last couple of cycles. The ones that were elected in the last couple of cycles are the problem. I've been there for 11 years. I've never seen it like this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Martinek. The members of the town council are the face of this town, and when they're elected, they have a responsibility to serve on behalf of the people, and again, not at the expense of the people. Certain councillors, such as my incumbents to my right, uh, talk about endlessly uh, about Robert's Rules. Robert's Rules of Order, they quote, quote verse and chapter. They talk about walking, you know, talk the talk, they don't walk the walk, they don't apply them to themselves. And for those that don't know Robert's Rules, it's about protocol, process, procedure, three things that they don't understand well. They have no problem with berating, uh, degrading, or just being plain out nasty to people that come up to speak, 
who have every right to speak, as well as to fellow counselors. They need to come together. They need to learn that this is a democracy. It's not a dictatorship. The only way that that gap is going to be bridged is, is if somebody can finally get through to the chair, to the vice chair, and those that support those actions, that's no longer going to be tolerated. And the only way to do that is through voting and making a change. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hyde. Yes, from some of the uh, council members that are on right now, I have seen some rudeness at various meetings and stuff like that. And um, that would be nice to have that changed. But one thing um, I, I really admired in this one councilman, an issue was, came up and um, a gentleman was seeking money. And the councilman did his research and he stated how that the uh, board of directors wasn't on there since 2007 and he motioned to postpone the uh, grant for this money where I seen the other ones just making up different rules saying, you know, it's okay. And then I seen the town manager saying, no, it's okay. So the guy ended up getting the money. But what I think is the council people should really do as much research as this other councilman did. Mr. Moriarty. I, I think it's, it's pretty clear that the, the culture, the climate that's been fostered uh, on the council is is a major detriment to this town uh, in a number of ways. Uh, far too often when somebody comes up to the podium there during citizens forum or, or otherwise, uh, if, if you look around the dais up here, uh, you know, whether or not it's seen on camera or not, more often than not, more than all but one or two counselors, they're looking down, they're rolling their eyes, otherwise they're just not paying any attention, they're disregarding what's being said, uh, things like that. I think those who know me uh, and those who, who know me by reputation uh, know that I, uh, you know, on my end, pretty open-minded, level-headed, uh, and that's what I think we need. I think we need adults up here. We don't need overgrown, spoiled children. <laughs> Ms. Pelequin. Our local political culture is its a legitimate challenge, um, to say the least. Um, one of the big reasons I'm running is because I believe that we as a community deserve a local government that we can be proud of. And this is something I would really like to work on. Um, just, just to throw this out there, I know that I've personally been the target of a lot of this um, negative behavior from counselors and um, I don't take any of that personally. Um, and if I'm elected, I really want to commit to fostering a good professional working relationship with everybody on the council, independent of any disagreements we may have had in the past. Um, when I disagree about something with somebody, it's about the issue. It's not about the person. I think this is a place for professionalism and courtesy and respect. It should be about the people of Southbridge and the policies, not about personalities. Thank you. For our next uh, group of questions, for the second round, the uh, first answer will be Ms. Hyde. Southbridge has a school system in transition. From a seat on the town council, what do you hope to do to positively affect those changes? Could you repeat that, sir? Southbridge has a school system in transition. From a seat on the town council, what do you hope to do to positively affect those changes? Personally, with the changes of the school, first of all, I would like to see an open house go out, go out to the students. Let them go see what they're encountering because I think if they just go into a new building, and have no clue where they're going, I, I think you're looking at a little bit of chaos. From what I understand, the place is pretty big, and as I drive by it, it's quite large. <laughs> but um, as far as that, uh, being on the council, I definitely would like to open house to the entire public, just so that they could see this is a lot of what your money is going to in uh, to promote the education of children. Thank you. 
Mr. Moriarty? As, as someone who's, whose income uh, comes from, from the classroom, uh, I can say that, I've, and I've toured the new middle school, high school complex, uh, and, it, and it's fantastic. It's a great, great uh, thing for this town, uh, and well overdue. Uh, as far as what the council can do, as far as affecting change in a positive manner, uh, we need to do, this council needs to do a better job of communicating with the school department. Uh, they need to do a better job of holding the school department uh, accountable, as well as being ready, willing, and able to uh, listen to what's going on and, and push for positive changes. Uh, when I was covering the town for the paper back uh, during the time of the two and a half override, there were a couple times the council of the whole and school committee met in joint sessions. I can't see how many times that's been done since then. Why doesn't that happen on a more regular basis? That's another positive change that could happen. Thank you. Ms. Pelliquin. One of the, new, um, the good things about the uh, new middle high school, which I've also toured, and I have to say it's fantastic, I can't wait for my kids to go there someday, um, is we had the school building committee, which was made up of members of the town council and the school committee working together on this project. And I think that having good communication and a good working relationship between those two boards is essential for the success of our school system. And um, this is an issue that is incredibly important to me as a parent of two children who are going to be entering the school system in the next two years. So I'm definitely a big supporter of our public schools. Thank you. Mr. Lazo. Yes, again, I'll go back to my experience on council. Uh, used to be us and them. Uh, recently, in the last maybe five, six years, uh, council and school committee have worked pretty much together. We've got the new school off on the right foot. Council and school committee work together on getting that together, which is a big positive thing for the town. People come and look to where they're going to move. They look and see what kind of a school you have, what kind of a school district you're, you're, you're supporting here. And uh, that will bring new people, new faces to town. Uh, as far as council helping uh, on the uh, school committee, we have to be diligent on the tax part of it because we do represent the people and the taxpayers in the town. And that's their part of the biggest part of our budget is the school department. So we have to uh, be diligent on that and yet be pro-education. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Martinek. I'm going to try to take bits and pieces of everything that everybody said because I agree with everything. It's a matter of communicating better. It's a matter of, of showing support for the school committee. Uh, I think from a town council perspective, it's also a matter of letting uh, the general public know that you're not supporting one over the other. There's obviously within the school committee, there's different factions as there are with the town council. Uh, there's dissension between union members and non-union uh, individuals regarding uh, the school. The one thing that I've waited 12 years for, when I first moved here, I was told that we were going to have a brand new school because when I moved into town, before I closed in my house, I looked at the high school. And I looked at that, and I'm not usually a judge a book by its cover kind of person, but I did say to myself, if I had to send my kids to that place, I'd sooner toss them out of town somewhere else. I think it's the one shining light that we have right now that offers us some hope, and I think that everything anybody can do on the council to help support that, be it financially or otherwise, is a wise move. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will be started by Mr. Moriarty. Which form of government do you think is best suited for Southbridge and why? I'm assuming that the question is more or less referencing uh, selectmen uh, or town meeting format versus what we currently have. Uh, and this is one where uh, I, can, I can draw off the experience of, of covering not just Southbridge but other communities such as Charlton uh, and, and a number of other communities uh, here as well as in, in northeastern Connecticut. Uh, while there is a great appeal for the direct democracy that a town meeting format brings, uh, there are also a great number of challenges that it brings. And I'm sure that, that in your role as moderator there, you've, you've seen the gamut. Um, I've covered uh, in, in various towns uh, these town meetings, whether they're the annual or the specials, uh, where they don't have enough for a quorum, where a meeting uh, can more or less be hijacked through uh, essentially a filibuster or by bringing in one political clique or group that kind of dominates the whole scene. Uh, I 
while I think that our current form is, is far from perfect, uh, it, it, to me, it's, it's, it's a move backwards to move towards the town meeting form at this point. Thank you. Ms. Peliquin. So I can talk about this, but I just want to specify that I'm talking about this as a resident of the, commu the community and as a voter, not as a political candidate, because I think that members of the town council should really um, not be really too involved with making substantive changes to our charter, because that is a document that is made by the community for the community, and it shouldn't be politicized. Um, that being said, I um, was totally interested in that petition that went around this year about the... Um, moved back to a town form of government, although there were a lot of specific things in the petition that I didn't really agree with. I personally think that if we had a town form of government, we would need to have a representative town meeting, not an open town meeting. Um, and barring that, I also, um, I'm really intrigued by the idea of a mayor, which is another idea that a lot of people have talked about in town. There's only nine communities in Massachusetts that have a council manager form of government, and I think it's really unpopular in Massachusetts for a reason. Thank you. Mr. Lazo. Uh, I'm not going backwards to the selectman uh, form, uh, but I don't uh, feel that the council form is working either. Uh, I would be in favor of trying the mayoral form of government. Uh, that way there, I, I think it's, I think it, uh, it's better without the town manager form uh, because I think it, it gets a little too, uh, well, again, you're going to go back to the five votes to keep the town manager happy. The town manager keeps the five happy. Uh, it, it's a little better with the mayor form of government, I think. Uh, going back to selectmen, I think it's going to move backwards. Thank you. Mr. Martinek? Yeah, this issue came up when I was serving on the Charter Review uh, Committee, and we talked about different forms of government. We talked about a town manager, town administrator, town meeting, uh, as the recent petition went around, as well as a mayoral form of government. <coughs> Pardon me. Recently, when the petition went around, although I didn't support it, I actually did sign it. And the reason I didn't support it was not because I was against anybody's initiative to move it forward. It was because you can't move back to a non-existent charter. And I also am not uh, satisfied that if you can't get, as, as Sean was talking about, if you can't get enough people to come to a town council meeting because they've been scared away by the actions of the councillors, you're going to have a heck of a time getting a quorum, which is why I was one of two people on the Charter Review Committee that supported the mayoral form of uh, government. I think that with that kind of accountability, you have the ability to very quickly, every two or every four years, say to that person, based on your experience, based on what you've done job for, 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 yeah, if I could say it again, performance-wise, you deserve another couple of years or you don't. I think it's the best and cleanest way to do it. Thank you. Ms. Hyde? Okay, I'm not going to lie. I don't know a whole great deal on this topic, but um, from what I understand, with the town council having to have a certain amount of votes, from what I see, it's definitely easy. They get it. I've lived in a town that they did have a mayor, and honestly, I didn't see half of the problems with that town as a lot of the problems that I do see in this town with the uh, town <clears throat> manager and especially with uh, selectmen and stuff like going back. It just seems like that would be a step back and not in the right direction to me. Thank you. Our next question will be first answered by Ms. Peliquin. Is $250 a reasonable fine for a trash law violation? No. <laughs> um, just since I have more time to kill here, I would also like to say that I think if you sit down and read our trash bylaw, it is incredibly um, obtuse and poorly written. The bylaw needs to be rewritten for clarity. The fine needs to be reduced. And I don't think it's appropriate to use the former recycle bank money to hire a trash consultant and uh, police overtime for enforcement. That was for recycling education and incentives, not for a trash consultant and a trash cop. Thank you. Mr. Lazo. I agree with everything Amelia said. Uh, but this bylaw has been on the books for a long time, and one of the incumbents that is running is a father of that bylaw, and he stands by it. 
well, $250 is a lot of money for people at this time. Uh, it, it, you know, to get slapped with a fine of $250 is just awful. Uh, it should be reduced. There should be a steps, graduated steps, if, if they're going to be fining people for, for that. I don't agree with uh, paying a police officer to go and knock on your door and be the Gestapo type of uh, town uh, where they're going to force you to do that. The uh, two hearings offices that they just re that they hired uh, with stipends of $2,500 a piece. Nothing against the two people that were hired, but this is more money that's being thrown out there. Uh, from this $250 that are collecting from the poor people, the poor taxpayers of the town of Southbridge. Uh, it's just a, a, an awful thing that should be changed and it should be rewritten. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Martinek? <laughs> well, I'm sure as heck not going to say yes, it's a good thing. <laughs> I mean, if you put it in perspective, let's take a look at this. Look at the different things that you can be fined for in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Possession of less than an ounce of marijuana, $100. $250 for inappropriate trash in Southbridge. That's not really something that says to people, make Southbridge home, come here. We wanted to have clear plastic bags. As soon as that came out, I thought privacy issues. And I had a couple of women actually say to me, what are we supposed to do with our toiletries? Are we supposed to expose those to the trashmen? Why is that so important? The fact that we get down as a town council to this minuscule minutia of, of trying to make a punitive thing based on what they themselves have said is a small number of people, you've got to work on the small number of people. You don't penalize the whole for what the few are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hyde. $250 to me is a joke. <laughs> I mean, let's be serious about it. First of all, there's so many people in this town that rent. So who's getting the, the fine, the landlord? the actual owner, but maybe he doesn't live there. He could live out in the, uh, another town. And so how does he know what his people are doing until he gets that fine and telling him he's got to pay? So to me, as far as that, that, that is a complete joke. But not only that, um, if the town is doing this, my question also is that, OK, they're taking my trash container and all this, but when they dump it, they go to throw, they just throw the thing back. So if it breaks, now who's gonna replace it? You know, I mean, I don't, am I allowed to give them a fine for not properly putting it back? That's my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Moriarty. Uh, Abraham Lincoln had once stated that uh, the best way to get a bad law repealed is to enforce it strictly. And I think that's exactly what this this administration has done uh, in, in the last several months. Uh, I think it's, it's not uh, uh, something that people haven't noticed as far as they have scaled back a bit on the enforcement because of the, the pushback from the community, which is more than justified. Uh, it's, I, I, I don't have a problem. I support the idea of, of punishing those who, who take a, a, a dozen trash bags and toss them out on the curb three days before the trash pickup and you've got skunks and, and vermin rummaging through it. That's one thing. But uh, when, when little old granny puts out her CVS bag with a handful of things <laughs> and she gets fined $250 on her fixed income when she's reliant on maybe that AO pension if she's still there from, from when that's been gone or from Social Security, that's a big chunk of her change. Uh, it, it, it's really, it's killing a mosquito with a shotgun. Uh, next question will be first addressed to Mr. Lazo. <coughs> Do you think the town budget is too large, just right, or not large enough? What would you change about it? I think it's too large. It's been large for many years. Uh, I think the town hall is uh, bloated. I think the budget's well padded. Uh, Council that sits there, they don't go line item and take out things. They just rubber stamp it in subcommittee and send it up to the floor for a vote. Uh, the only way to change it is to put diligent councilors on that are uh, uh, taxpayer friendly and go line item at budget time and remove what's not needed. That's the only way to stop it. And. Uh, 
Otherwise, it's going to be continuous and keep going. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Martinek? I was looking forward to a question like this, because earlier today when you had the school committee, you asked the same Goldilocks question. Is it too big, too small? Just right. Well, here is the 2013 budget, ladies and gentlemen. 268 pages. By the way, if you go to votefordennis.com, you can get a copy that I took the time last weekend to scan. It's off-center, by the way, because that's the way it was presented to me, just so you know. But you know what? You go through this, and I would, I would encourage people to look at every line item, every request. There are some in here that make sense. You can't tell the fire department, you're going to run into a burning building. We're not going to give you the self-contained breathing apparatus. Hold your breath as long as you can and then come back out. Those things are, are obvious. We've just approved a $172,000 street sweeper. We've approved a $125,000 backhoe. And now word has it, because somebody's jealous and wants to get one themselves, they want to put in for another backhoe. There is so much fat in here. And this, by the way, is a transparent document, should be available to every citizen. It would have cost me $54 to get it through the town manager's office. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hyde? It's hard to beat that one. But, uh, definitely, I agree. It is uh, way too high. And to make it short and simple, um, from what I understand, they approve two brand new police cars every single year. And uh, like in my eyes, I think we need to start holding people responsible when doing their job. It's like, why are they getting so run down and why are they getting beaten up and all this? So it's time to hold some people accountable. Not to mention uh, creating jobs. It's like, do we actually need this many townspeople? Because honestly, I go through the town and a lot of times all I see is three to four workers out there. So it's like, where's the rest of them? You know, so as far as I'm concerned, I thoroughly agree. I bet you there's a ton of fat in that document right there. Thank you. Mr. Moriarty? In general, I don't, I don't necessarily mind paying taxes so long as I'm confident and I can see that my tax dollars are being used properly, that they're being used uh, to further the town, better the town, better the town's people. Uh, provide the services that we need uh, in an efficient manner. When I do mind paying taxes are when I feel that that's not the case. Uh, and that's, that's currently the position that we have here. Uh, going th you can go through the budget, and I've, I've looked through some of the budget, uh, a good number, a good part of it. Uh, and there are places where you can, you can try to trim things down a little bit here and there. Granted, there are fixed costs, and there are certain things that will go up every year uh, regardless. It's just the cost of business. But we have to make a point of trying to be efficient, uh, trying to reduce costs where we can, uh, and get the best bang for the buck. I'd rather spend the long dollar than continually patching the same holes, uh, those sort of things. But in general, uh, it, it does need to come down. Thank you. Ms. Pelliquin. Um, It's too large. And I'm, I'm a Democrat. I'm not ideologically anti-tax. I believe in the public trust, but we are spending more than ever. We're charging all of these indirect costs to our water and sewer funds. We're taking a million dollars a year out of the landfill enterprise fund, and our tax rates are still going up. Um, I've been going door to door in the community to um, say hello to people and, and tell them about my campaign. And I've met a lot of really hardworking families and seniors who are struggling to stay in their houses. Um, and I, I really feel accountable to those people. If I was elected to the council, I'd definitely be more fiscally conservative than the sitting councilors. Um, we should be looking for ways to economize, like sharing administrative support across departments, maybe civilian dispatchers for public safety, look at regionalization of services. Um, but just to, just to clarify, I'm talking about the town side. I'm not talking about the school side. Um, I don't think our school budget is too large. Um, a street sweeper costs $172,000, but an education is priceless. Thank you. And our last question this, evening, this afternoon will be first answered by Mr. Martinek. The town has invested much in our landfill contract, in the construction of Commercial Drive, and in the development of an industrial park. How do you foresee this impacting our community? Well, I, th I think at present it has adversely impacted our community. Uh, as I said three years ago when I was on the Planning and Economic Development Committee, we were 
taking trips to New Bedford and other places to see how did they operate their industrial park. On the 13th of April 2009, a bunch of people got up here at Citizens Forum and spoke passionately about a number of reasons why we needed to have an access road to the industrial park. The access road costs seven and a half million dollars. We've now again found out last week it doesn't go to the industrial park. So I'm not sure what we've been doing the last three years trying to bring businesses into, but apparently it only ends at the landfill. Is it a good and viable idea? I don't know because I've never seen any studies. It comes back to the accountability. We keep talking about it. For three years we've been talking about it. We were told if we didn't build it, all these businesses were going to surrounding towns. All these jobs would be lost. My question is, where are those lost jobs? Where are those lost companies that were, were coming to town once we built this magical road? We were told if they build it, if we build it, they will come. They built it. Where the hell are they? I can't find them. I go up and down the road, I look for the, the off-ramp that says industrial park, I've yet to find it. We're not necessarily a specialist in this, and perhaps the best way to go about doing it at this point is find somebody that is a specialist and evaluate, does it make sense to actually develop this, or is it less cost-effective to, to actually start doing anything with it? We obviously don't know how to handle money, how to invest it wisely. It's one of many industrial parks that's far off of Route 84, the Pike, and Route 20. There's a lot of already developed industrial parks. To me, as it was three years ago, it seems to be a pipe dream. The way that it's heading without somebody that's held accountable, a town manager and the director of economic development, if they're not uh, capable of finding somebody that's able to make a decision on it, we should abandon the idea. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hyde. As far as my opinion with this one, I'm, I'm kind of for it. Because um, if it's done in the proper way, I mean, you don't go up there and you don't start clearing all this land and pray that businesses are going to come. I just feel that what you need to do in the beginning is to go out and start marketing and get agreed upon companies, businesses, whatever stating that they will take a slot and take a portion of it and develop there. Then also you could give them the option. We can develop it for you or you can hire a private developer, whichever way. But either way, I just think that with the industrial park, it does have a good possibility of bringing future jobs. Thank you. Mr. Moriarty? So far, there's, there's two parts to this. Uh, it's, so far, there's, there's really been no benefit to the town for this, per se. Uh, a few of the folks on, on Pleasant Street may say otherwise because they, they don't have those, those trucks rumbling up their streets day and night uh, any longer. But generally, for the town as a whole, uh, I, I don't think that it's, it's even come close or sniffed uh, where it was supposed to be. Um, far too much of it is is similar to, I forget which speaker had stated, uh, it's a bit of a pipe dream at the moment. Uh, unless the council and the manager are able to find the, the proper mix to make that work, which thus far they've, they've flailed, not just failed, but they're flailing uh, all over the place as to what they can do there. That nothing's worked as yet, uh, and at some point we have to make a move or, or get off the pot. Thank you. Ms. Peliquin? I don't like to call it an industrial park access road because the road does not actually access the industrial park. It's a driveway to the landfill. Um, back in 2009, there was a really active and vocal group of people with a plan to build a road. It wasn't a plan to build an access, uh, in a, an industrial park, it was a plan to build a road. They said businesses were banging down the door to come to Southbridge and if we didn't build this road, we would be losing out on opportunities and we have yet to see a benefit to the community from this road. Um, and I don't understand how this happens. Like, did the council vote on this without looking at a map or something? <laughs> like, it's, it's very perplexing to me. Um, I think in terms of the economic development to the town and, and, you know, the future opportunities for our resources, we're gonna see a lot more out of the um, Southbridge Redevelopment Authority's urban revitalization plan to uh, redevelop the uh, Central Street and downtown area. And that's more of a priority for me. Thank you. Mr. Lasso? Yes, thank you, Pete. Uh, this road has been a thorn in my side for a long time. Uh, 
I did a lot of research on it before the votes were taken. Again, uh, one of the previous speakers said, build it and they'll come. I heard that too. Uh, the town tied its hands up by bonding this road for Casella. Our bonding capacity is tied up here. Uh, we only have 49 acres. Unex ex uh, you can't get to this 49 acres unless you blast through mountains of ledge on this first stretch of this road. Our real industrial park land is another $7.5 million away. This road ends at the scales at the landfill. This tells me that it's a dump road. I went to those other, I was one of the people on the committee that went to those other towns with the town manager and the news and everybody to look at these other industrial parks. They're basically flat level areas where these industrial parks are. Not on a mountain, they didn't have to blast through tons of ledge and, and uh, to get to them. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We'll now, move go on. To, <laughs> we'll now move to closing remarks. Each of the candidates will have three minutes to give their closing statement. And we will start with Mr. Moriarty. We have just more than two weeks remaining before the voters cast their ballots and make a big decision on what kind of town they want going forward. Do they want things to continue as they have over the last few years? There's been plenty of talk, but when all is said and done, much more has been said than actually done. Uh, in the real world, things don't just happen by talking about them. Things are made to happen. Do the voters want knee-jerk reactionaries making decisions on their behalf? You don't lead by hitting people over the head. That's assault, not leadership. <coughs> I believe we need level-headed, and open-minded individuals weighing all of the information and input from all of the town's peoples. I'm not looking to find faults, but rather we're, our job up here is to find fixes. Take those faults and, and find the fixes. Do they want cliques or political allegiances? I believe the town wants and deserves free and independent thinkers. My only allegiance here is to the town of Southbridge. I'm not Democrat, I'm not Republican, I'm not part of any group. Do they want politicos? Do they want naysayers? that are running because not so much that they're a great candidate, but because they don't like the other candidates? Do they want someone that's running to give themselves pats on the back? As I said earlier tonight, I believe that we need a council that's committed to the community and dedicated to progress. I hope that you find your ways uh, to the polls on June 26, and I hope that when you do so, uh, you vote for Sean Moriarty. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Peliquin. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody here in the audience for showing up today. I really, it's nice to see a nice crowd of people out here for this debate. Um, going door to door in the community, I've been kind of demoralized to see just how many people have no concept of what's going on in local government. Um, so those of you who are paying attention, please come out and please vote. This is a very important election. Um, if you're unhappy with the direction things have, gone, things have gone this year, there's a lot of great choices for you up here. Um, it's too bad that the incumbents didn't come tonight. Um, but I've personally, as a resident, um, I've done my best to advocate for the rights of, of just regular citizens, residents of the community, um, whether that be the right to speak at meetings or the trash policy. I really just, I feel like we need to have a government that we can be proud of, that works for the common person in town, the taxpayer, the homeowner, the young family, the senior, um, and I'd like to be that person for you if you would consider voting for me on June 26th. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Lazo. Thank you. I want to thank you, Peter, for being the moderator here today. I want to thank the Southbridge Democratic Town Committee, uh, Larry McDonald. I want to thank the Republican Town Committee, Bob Chinerski and Mike Jaynes. Uh, in closing, if you want uh, the most experience in town government, I'm your candidate. I. Uh, Everybody knows me, I'm not new to it. Uh, I'm willing to work with the present council that's there. Uh, I want to use my experience to help this town become the crown jewel of Central Mass, not the town landfill of Central Mass. I ask the voters of Southbridge to support me, and vote for me on election day, June 26th. I uh, want to bring my experience back to the council and work for the better of the town. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Martinet. I did this three years ago. I have to do it today. It's an early time to do it, but I have to wish my gorgeous wife a happy 19th wedding anniversary a week early. 
and also give a shout out to my children who are terrific, Jack and Grace. Now you can go outside and play. <laughs> There's a reason why we have two counselors that are not here, and to me that's of concern. The simple fact is every time there's a photo opportunity, they're always there to be found. Standing on one's record apparently is a very difficult thing this election cycle. George Bernard, Bernard Shaw said it, but Bobby Kennedy made it infamous. Some people see things as they are and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask why not. Being elected a town councilor is a privilege and an honor that should not end when the election is over. We owe it to the people of Southbridge with each decision made to ask, A, is this item a nice to have or a need to have? If it's a need to have, is there a less costly way of accomplishing the objective? And if we can answer both A and B in the affirmative, what value does that bring to our town? I mentioned before we can't ask our firefighters to run in and hold their breath in a fire, nor can we ask our police to catch a criminal with a slingshot. We also can't ask our teachers to buy their own supplies. But we should ask until the economy changes, shouldn't the town councilors, the incumbents, and the town manager be good stewards of our money and not buy the nice-to-haves until we're in a better financial situation. We recently found out, as I mentioned, that the access road, after years of telling us otherwise, actually doesn't go to the industrial park, and those people need to be held accountable for their comments. Former Councilor Ron Chernisky said, quote, there are at least four potential new business ventures as of now with plenty of room to expand, 13 April 2009. Southbridge can no longer accept mere words and empty promises as a means to intimidate us into spending money on something that turns out, in hindsight, to be untrue. We are the town of Southbridge. Instead of Town Manager Clark negotiating to have Casella build another road on what he said is referred to, as Steve mentioned, the Khyber Pass, because we can't afford it, in return for giving Casella property, why don't we negotiate from a position of strength? Tell Casella to retire the debt on the road that we already built, and we'll figure out how to build our own road if it has actual benefits. If they want to buy it property, if they want to buy property, we'll sell it to them, not give it to them. I thank you all very much, and please go to votefordennis.com. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hyde. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming out. And uh, basically what you have to ask yourself is, are you happy with the way the town is being run? Um, personally, everyone up here that's sitting here today, we all feel that we could do a little bit better. And so that's why we're running, because we really don't think the town is being ran, run up to standard. But uh, anybody that knows me, I've been in business a long time. And it's funny because when you deal with me in business, I am like a fighter. And I will research for you. And I promise that... I can't give you a thousand promises saying, I will do this, I will do this, but I can guarantee you, I will definitely fight for you if the cause is in my corner and saying, okay, I believe in this 100%, I will totally go to, I'll go out on the wire for you. So I do hope to see everybody out there that's going to be voting, and if you vote for G. Marie Hyde, um, you, you're getting a fighter. Thank you. Concludes our debate. I'd like to uh, thank all of the candidates for, um, for being willing to serve their town. I'd like to especially thank the ones who came out here to introduce themselves to the voters. I'd like to thank the Charlton Democratic and Republican, the South of the Southbridge Democratic and Republican <laughs> Town Committees. <laughs> I'm not used to saying Southbridge there. And uh, for putting this on. And I'd like to remind you that you can vote for three of the seven candidates on June 26th. I'll turn over the microphone to the Chairman McDonald and James. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I didn't realize Charlton and Southbridge were so similar. <laughs> I would like to thank uh, all the candidates for coming. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the, the uh, crew that has helped out, Tommy Ayal, Bob Cantera, John McHugh. Without them, we would not be able to do this. I've really enjoyed working with the, uh, the Democrats here, Larry McDonald. And, uh, do you have any words there? I enjoyed working with the Republican Town Committee as well, and uh, I think you said everything except I want to thank the Chatham Town Moderator. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Pete Cooper as well, the Chatham Town Moderator for his part. Thank you all for tuning in, and uh, the most important thing is on June 26th, please, this is your town, your vote counts, it's your government. Make your voice be heard 
by getting out and marking a block for your candidate. Thank you. So how many times can we get